The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And new at 6, Governor Greg Abbott announcing steps to mitigate the surge in the case of coronavirus here in Texas. First of all, the governor is asking hospitals to postpone elective medical procedures to increase hospital capacity for COVID patients. The governor also directing the Texas Division of Emergency Management to and excuse me, DSHS to open additional COVID-19 antibody infusion centers in communities across the state to treat patients who have COVID but do not need to be hospitalized. Also announced increased vaccine availability across the state to give out more COVID-19 vaccines. The governor says Texas has the resources it needs to combat the spread of the coronavirus. He's stating that Texans could help booster those efforts by getting the vaccine, which he calls proven protection. Now to a distressing figure from Metro Health right here at home, especially with this Delta variant taking hold in San Antonio. According to Metro Health, of the city's 1.2 million Latinos, 60% are unvaccinated. Our Jesse Degollado says a leading Latino health researcher at UT Health San Antonio believes much of the blame is on misinformation on social media. Appeals by Tejano celebrities and eye-catching murals. Both efforts by Metro Health try to counter COVID-19 misinformation on social media. Among the most avid followers, communities of color. You know, they sometimes are, are, are trying to find the most vulnerable that are most likely to believe this information. Oh, yes. And you know why? Because I wanted everything I could get my hands on. Salud America has her story on its website to urge more Latinos not to do what she did, even though her job in Harlingen is to train public health workers. Cavazos had looked on questionable websites for specific information regarding her pre-existing conditions and the vaccine. That is until finally Cavazos called her doctors, who told her if she got the vaccine. You will not end up in the ICU at the hospital and you will not die because it's protecting you. That did it, she says. Cavazos was convinced. Yes, it was uh, social media. Out of negativity. Monique Chavez told us last Thursday that's why she's still at University Hospital recovering from COVID. She'd believed what she'd heard and read. Take a look at that information. If it is not true, don't pass it on. You know, you know, do a favor to, to yourselves, to your family, to your community. Don't pass that information on. We have to trust that this works because it does work. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Misinformation about the vaccine is all over the internet and on social media. It can be hard to know what's true and what's not. We've run several claims through our KSAT Trust Index, and you can find them all on ksat.com slash trust index. That's where you can also submit anything that you think is questionable that you'd like to get an answer to. ksat.com slash trust index. It has been two weeks since the death of Nita Matiarina, who was inadvertently shot by a San Antonio police officer during a standoff. Her family now getting ready for her funeral later this week. Erica Hernandez sat down with her mother and the family's attorney to talk about what's next. <laughs> A mother in mourning, Maria Tijerina, not only dealing with the loss of her child, but also trying to figure out how she's going to raise her four grandkids. Tengo que ser muy fuerte por mis nietos. Maria had to wait here across the street from the apartment complex for several hours until police finally came over to tell her what happened to her daughter. She said that eventually police told her that her daughter was no longer alive. She says a couple days later, San Antonio police met with her to tell her that while attempting to shoot the suspect, Angel Sanchez, who police say was pointing a shotgun towards officers, her daughter, who was inside the apartment, was hit. At a press conference, Chief McManus said that the evidence suggests her death was caused by SAPD, but are still waiting on the medical examiner's findings. As to what's next, the family holds no anger towards police, but only hope they do the right thing. It was a tragic situation. It was a tragic mistake. Unfortunately, now that mistake has to be corrected. Whether any lawsuit is pending, the family's attorney, Desi Martinez, says it's still too early to know until the investigation is fully complete. And as Maria moves forward with raising her daughter's four kids, she hopes her daughter is remembered for being a happy person who was a good mother. 
Erica Hernandez, KSAT 12 News. A man is now in police custody after holding a woman and teenager hostage. This happened in the 1900 block of South Steves Avenue that's on the city's east side. Police got to the scene around 7 o'clock this morning and were able to get the woman and the teenager out of that house safely around 10 a.m. Officers say the man did not comply with police and might have been experiencing a mental health episode. They did have to deploy rubber bullets to ensure that he was taken into custody without any other extremes being taken, which um, he's okay, he was tended to, he was verbal, talking, and he'll be cared for, and then um, booked for the charges and the active warrant. The 46-year-old man did have a warrant out for his arrest at the time of this standoff, but the charges he was facing are unclear. We know he is now facing four counts of assault causing bodily injury by a wanted person and one charge of unlawful restraint. The parents of 25-year-old Daniela Loot are speaking out for the first time since she was killed in a wrong way fiery crash over the weekend. They say Loot, a registered nurse, a loving soul who always cared for others. She had a goal to work as a nurse in geriatrics and was always finding ways to make that happen. She and 27-year-old Diana Rubio were killed along I-35 and Walsham Road after police say 58-year-old suspected drunk driver Ricardo Rodriguez crashed head-on into their vehicle after driving the wrong way going 90 miles an hour. Lute's family and loved ones now left to pick up the pieces. Who would have thought my baby was gone? Nothing that this guy did or nothing that happened, uh, the, the tragic end of this angel's journey here on earth can overshadow her light. It, it can't and they won't. The family says they want to raise awareness about the dangers behind intoxicated driving. Rodriguez, who's currently in the hospital from his injuries in the crash, facing two counts of intoxication manslaughter. San Antonio firefighters answering a 911 call early this morning where they were expecting to find smoke and flames. The man found dead inside of that apartment on Dartbrook Drive near Fredericksburg Road was not expected. Katrina Weber tells us why they had no problem getting into his home. A smoke alarm continues its warning, even hours after the fire that set it off early this morning had been put out. Arson investigators also continue to work, looking for clues about what caused it and the death of a man found inside. Firefighters who arrived around 4 a.m. discovered him in a bedroom of one unit at the Fred Town Homes. At least one neighbor was already fearing the worst. As I look, I can see like, uh, like thick smoke coming from my vent from my next door neighbor. So I go outside and I can hear the fire alarm going off. Joanna Espinosa says he ran to that apartment next door trying to help, losing a shoe along the way. I go to his front door and I knock and lo, lo and behold, the door is open. I go in the door and it's so smoky I can't even see in there. After three failed attempts to stand up to the smoke, Espinosa says he had to back out and wait for help. Firefighters who finally reached the man tried to perform CPR, but they couldn't save him. Neighbors, meanwhile, had evacuated their homes, taking with them everything they could. Firefighters say there was more smoke here than anything else, so there really was no fire damage to any other apartments. The people here were allowed to go back in and begin airing things out. Even after carefully going through the apartment, arson investigators still have a lot to figure out, including why the door was open. All they were able to determine about this deadly fire early on is that it started in the kitchen. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. State Democrats who left for Washington, D.C., breaking quorum to keep a restrictive elections bill from passing cannot be arrested. That's according to a state judge. That judge out of Travis County issued an order blocking the arrests late last night that restricts Governor Greg Abbott and House Speaker Dade Phelan from detaining, confining, or otherwise restricting the free movement of House Democrats within the state or issuing any warrants ordering their confinement. The restraining order will expire in two weeks unless it's extended. A hearing has been set for August 20th, where Abbott and Phelan will have to show why a temporary injunction should not be filed against them. More than 50 House Democrats left for Washington, D.C. to block the elections bill from passing. Phelan issued a warrant for their arrest, but the judge's order allows Democrats to come home without having to worry about that, at least for now.
Live look outside, and it's kind of a steamy Monday, but my yard is not as green as I would like it to be. Adam. <laughs> Getting a little crunchy I now. Would like, I would like some rain in the forecast. Yeah, I would too. I mean, we've been very fortunate. Let's not lose sight of that, but it'd be nice to have just a nice little maintenance shower here and there. This week is generally looking dry. 93 degrees outside right now. Feels like 101 when you factor in the humidity. Temperatures. Not outrageous, actually pretty close to average. 88 Bernie now, 92 Seguin, 93 Randolph, Castroville, 95 Hondo at 92. And we'll gradually fall through the 80s this evening. So near average, humid of course, and then low clouds developing later. At least we have a nice breeze out there right now. At times gusting up to 20 to 25 miles per hour. System in the tropics we're watching. All the latest on that coming right up. Classes for San Antonio ISD students started today with the vast majority heading to school in person. That means the transportation department is dealing with more students than they did in the spring. Our Samuel King joins us now. Sam, a new app is helping parents and the school district. Yeah, they're launching what's called the Stop Finder app, and they expect around 9,000 students to use school transportation. It was only about two thirds of that earlier this year, and the new app is not the only change students and parents will see. Buses rolled out this morning from the San Antonio ISD Transportation Yard. About a dozen or so of the buses are brand new, but all of them have new tracking technology. You know, we're in the uh, technology age and, uh, you know, people use apps for just about everything these days. Um, you know, we're trying to offer that um, at your fingertips to, to be able to, for parents to see when their bus is going to arrive and uh, when it's going to pick up their student. That app is called Stop Finder, and Transportation Director Cesar Flores says SAISD is the first district in Bear County to launch it. Flores gave us a demonstration. Really nice part about it also is that it'll show, uh, it'll show their route, it'll show their stops, and it'll show uh, the bus when it's nearby. You can also see that uh, we can set up geo alerts for it. So parents can have time to get their students to the bus and not have to wait outside in extreme weather. Whether it was hot or cold or raining, you had to wait because if you missed it, you missed it. Flores says the app also includes the district's 500 new bus stops along existing routes, a way to make getting to class for students easier. Basically uh, adding a whole bunch of new stops so that we can get more students uh, the ability to get to school and uh, get them back in class and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, get them back to where it's a, a more enriched learning environment for them. And those new stops will not come at extra cost to taxpayers. If you are an SAISD parent interested in, you, in the new app, you can contact the district and they will send you a link to sign up. As for this evening's traffic, this is at US 90 at I-35. Some major delays on 90 uh, on, in a couple of areas. This one was because there was a vehicle fire and at the top of the hour you could see the smoke there in the distance. That is sort of faded away, but you can still see the, the major traffic delay there. So let's take a look at that on the map. This is the vehicle fires. There's at I-10 and Probant. So you can still see some westbound traffic and some eastbound traffic there still delayed. So watch out for that in that region. Also heading a little farther west, we've had some road repair work. We're going to continue to have that uh, near the county line up toward uh, Highway 211 here. So uh, that situation is greatly improved. So we'll take a look at the travel time there. 14 minutes between Castroville and Loop 1604. Once you're inside Loop 1604, it'll take you 15 minutes to get to 35. And you saw the delay there. A lot of other stuff going on too. Stuff on uh, Loop 410 and on Loop 1604. And finally, we'll take you out east here to Seguin. There's some police activity and that is closed uh, portions of I-10 there and that section you see in red so you're down to six miles per hour so if you're heading on I-10 eastbound in Seguin and probably westbound too just watch out for that police activity and that's causing some delays this evening busy time on the roads are back to school and people are driving and everything again so guys uh, we'll keep an eye on it throughout the show mm -hmm. busy getting last minute school supplies yeah out and about uh -huh. sky 12 in search of shade and they found some <laughs> at the pearl nice green space that they have out there yeah that'd be a good place to be this evening yeah it's nice to have those tall buildings around you yep. to give you some extra shade that's yep. always a bonus if you don't have the big sprawling oak trees doesn't hurt to have the uh, high rise to help you out there. So it's warm today. Yeah, hot. That's all subjective, but it's really not out of the ordinary for this time of year. 96 degrees, the high temperature. That's one degree below the average high. So we're facing pretty much 
average conditions across San Antonio and South Texas. Del Rio topped out at 101. Catula made it to triple digits. Kerrville 92 and New Braunfels had a high of 94. Let's talk about temperatures to right off the bat. Then we'll get into the tropics and take a look at the latest system that we're watching as it heads westward toward the Gulf of Mexico. Amarillo 103 today. Lubbock 99, Abilene 101. So a few more triple digits on the map than what we had last week at this time when we, of course, we had more of an active weather pattern. Uh, right now, we're still near triple digits in those locations. Those were the highs. The current temperatures are very close to the highs for the day. Notice Marfa at 85. We actually, actually have some shower activity in far west Texas, and that's dropping their temperatures a little bit. Right now, Pleasanton's 95, New Braunfels 93, and Kerrville still at 92. Tomorrow, just like today, we'll be in the mid 90s. It's the time of year we usually don't see big variations in our afternoon highs. But the key here, what really stands out is you're also not seeing triple digits. We're looking at mid 90s here the rest of this week and all the way through this upcoming weekend, maybe even shaving off a degree or two by Saturday and Sunday, dropping us to about 94. I mentioned the shower activity far west Texas. It's nice to see that. That's one part of Texas where we still have abnormally dry conditions and even a drought. One percent of the state down near Big Bend National Park. 1% south of Marathon. That's where we still have a drought and we're seeing some shower activity out there. It's good to have at least something. But what's interesting about the pattern as a whole across the nation is we don't have any one big defining feature. No big upper level high that's just in control and really pressing down on us. No major features right now. So the doors open for some activity. Just we're not anticipating any around here. You head out into the tropics. We've got a little bit of development here moving toward the Caribbean. This would be tropical depression six and potentially even Fred. Right now, max winds have sustained at 35 miles per hour, likely to become a low end tropical storm, but remain fairly weak on its trek westward toward the Gulf of Mexico. One reason it's really passing over a lot of land and whenever these systems interact with land, it inhibits their development and even weakens them. But by Saturday, once we get into the weekend, it could very well be in the eastern Gulf of Mexico and then we'll just have to give you the updated forecast beyond then. But right now through the weekend, we're anticipating it in the eastern Gulf and uh, closer to Florida at that time as a fairly weak system, but a rainmaker. Now keep in mind, this is the time of year where we start to see the tropical activity typically increase. Our peak is September 10th. So peak tropical activity in the Atlantic Basin is September 10th, and then it falls off a bit thereafter. So usually we start to see the tropics really start ramping up the activity this time of year, and we're starting to see a little bit of that now. Tomorrow, we'll start the day at 77, make it into the mid 90s, at least we'll have a nice breeze again. Today we've seen those gusts between 20 and 30 miles per hour. Tomorrow's going to be similar. A steady wind out of the southeast at 10 to 20 with some of those higher gusts. Uvalde tomorrow 96, 92 Rock Springs, Beeville 95 along with Gonzales, and triple digits in the typically warmer spots south and west of town. I do want to point out and reminder that tomorrow is a CPS Energy peak demand day. So try to lower your energy usage between 2 p.m. and 7 p.m. And we're not going to see any big changes the rest of the week. We talk temperatures still mid 90s, but notice a few rain chances back in the picture by Sunday and Monday. Still slight and isolated, but it's something. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. In my opinion, there's never a bad time to go to Vegas, <laughs> but I think this would probably be considered the primo time. Well, if you're the Spurs, they had no luck in Salt Lake. Yeah. They're hoping their odds improve in Las Vegas. So when we come back, can the Spurs finally pick up a win in the summer league? We'll get you started on their first game tonight. And our big game coverage previews take us to Fall City coming up. San Antonio Spurs will be looking for their first win in the NBA Summer League tonight when they face the Minnesota Timberwolves to tip off the Las Vegas version at the MGM Resorts. It's after they went 0-3 in the Utah Summer League play. Losses to both the Jazz squads and the Memphis Grizzlies in that 82-77 loss. Devin Vassell at 27 points. Spurs number one draft pick Josh Primo added another 17. They are just about to start. I think the first game that was on was delayed a little bit, so there's tip-off also delayed, so I have all the highlights for you tonight on the night beat. The Spurs confirming their trade with the Indiana Pacers that brought the
helped him the silver and black to Doug McDermott. The Pacers also sent the Spurs a 2023 protected second round pick, right to swap 2026 second round picks in exchange for the Spurs. 2023 second round pick, 6'8", 225 pound forward is expected to help the Spurs three point shooting since he was one of only 10 players to make more than 100 three porters while shooting better than 50% from the field overall. The Spurs providing us with this interview upon his arrival in the Alamo City. I think I'll bring a ton of shooting, uh, spacing uh, for the young guys and you know, I think one of my strengths is be able to move without the ball and um, really put pressure on the defense that way. So um, I think just my overall presence uh, moving around out there can put a lot of pressure on the defense and hopefully um, give guys um, some room to, to create and attack. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Pro Football Hall of Fame inducted two classes this weekend. The class of 2020, which included former Cowboys coach Jimmy Johnson and Cowboys safety Cliff Harris. The class of 2021 that included former Cowboy Drew Pearson. But the headliner for the class of 2021 was two-time Super Bowl champion quarterback Peyton Manning. He invited seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady to his acceptance speech, with Brady accepting, saying he wanted to make sure Peyton was retiring. What a moment watching his father Archie unveil his bust while his brother Eli watched on. Manning reserving a few zingers for Brady. By the time Tom Brady is inducted in his first year of eligibility in the year 2035, <laughs> he'll only have time to post his acceptance speech on his Instagram account. <laughs> <laughs> also inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame was Tom Flores, one of only two people, including Mike Ditka, who won a Super Bowl as a player, assistant coach, and head coach, collecting two Super Bowl wins as a Raiders head coach. Our big game coverage previews take us to Fall City, which is home to the Badland Beavers. Fall City is ranked sixth in the state, according to the preseason poll delivered by Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine, number one in District 16 2A Division II, with linebacker Cody Arasola rated preseason All-State. Head coach Mark Kirchhoff welcomes back 14 starters of a team that made it to Class 2A state semifinals with an 11-3 overall record, 6-0 in district last year. Of the eight returning starters on offense, it would include running back Trent Gendrish, who had 18 touchdowns rushing last year and six interceptions as a linebacker. Uh, you got to focus on what we lost and what we have to gain. I mean, we have a lot of spots to fill and a lot of people to step up and these guys are eager to learn and get better. We had a really good group of seniors last year and they led the team well. And what it means to me is like you come back and you just work extra hard. You got to put in more effort. If you want to get to the next level, that next step, you got to be able to work willingly hard every each and every day. All right, Fall City will kick out their season on Friday, August the 27th against Three Rivers at 7.30 p.m. And that, to me, is true Texas high school football because it's Iron Man football. You're on the field all the time on Both offense ways. and defense. And special teams. And special teams, <laughs> exactly. All Thanks, the Greg. ways. Thanks, Craig. We'll be right back. Usually by this time, the Texas legislature is done. Their business is taken care of, but... Now members are spread from Washington, D.C. all the way to Austin. Scott Braddock is with the Quorum Report, a fabulous place to try and keep up with everything that's going on in the Texas legislature right now. And Scott, it, obviously the quorum still the big thing, even though the, mm -hmm. the next special session opened this weekend. Yep. Is there any indication that a quorum is going to happen? I think there is. Uh, I wrote last week at quorumreport.com like it looked it, that it looked like we were coming to the end of the stalemate, and that was based on lots of conversations with different members on both sides of the aisle. Um, I do believe that there is a contingent within the Democratic caucus that wants to find a way back to uh, governing after what they feel was a successful month in Washington. Obviously, Republicans would take uh, issue with that, but the Democrats who fled to Washington would say that they were able to move the needle there. The United States Senate is, uh, you know, staying in session uh, for a little bit longer than had been planned, uh, you know, ahead of their August recess to take at least one more vote on voting rights. Just in the last few minutes, I can tell you that once again, just like during the first special session, a call has been placed on the House. What that means is the members of the House of Representatives have voted to lock themselves inside the House. They can only leave with the permission of the Speaker. And it also enables the Speaker to go ahead and issue civil arrest warrants for any Democrats who still won't show up. We do know that there are a number of Democratic representatives from around the state uh, who either yesterday or the day before flew back to Texas uh, to their districts in places like San Antonio and Houston, El Paso and elsewhere. Some of those folks, I saw them earlier today on the Texas House floor, but others were not there just yet. 
And because there's now this uh, extra impetus uh, in place, it may be that uh, they do decide to uh, head on back to the House. Maybe as soon as tomorrow, we might see a quorum. It looked like they had about 95 members on the House floor earlier. Um, and when they took the vote, I was grabbing it for you here, it was uh, 80 to 8. So some of those members, it looks like they walked off the floor for that vote. Hmm. You know, I remember before we started the first special session, we had you on this very segment talking about hmm. potential strategies among Democrats to keep uh, that voting restriction bill, the, the reason that so many left the state to go to Washington, D.C., to keep that from passing. It's yep. back on the agenda for this round two. Uh, so even if they do reach a quorum, Democrats returning to the Capitol, what's your idea of how they may strategize once again to, to keep this from passing? If they come back uh, and we have quorum in Austin and the legislature is once again able to do uh, business, that means that they'll have to fight it the old fashioned way on the floor. The quorum break is sort of the nuclear option, uh, but there are other ways to do battle legislatively. Um, and in a special session, there's only 30 days. Uh, and so when you have a lot on the agenda, as you do now, there's not always enough bandwidth to get all this stuff done. Although Governor Abbott has said he will call one special session after another, after another to try to pass this elections bill. Uh, but I would say this, Myra, one thing's very important. I think the very first walkout by the Democrats back in May, that it was legislatively successful. Think about the fact that Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and other Republicans have since said, uh, basically they have retreated from certain provisions of that legislation uh, that uh, they say won't go back in there. For example, um, uh, making it harder for African-Americans to vote on Sundays after church and allowing uh, judges to more easily overturn elections with no uh, evidence of fraud. Those are actual legislative victories for Democrats, things they can point to as a win. But I would say overall, an elections bill of some form that Republicans are going to say is all about election integrity. And I would say is about avenging former President Trump. Some form of that is going to pass. Talk about what we're seeing with school districts. Let's say ISD went back to school today. Mm -hmm. There are districts in Houston and Dallas that are basically openly defying uh, the governor, saying that there'll be no mask mandates out there. It mm -hmm. seems as if this is going to be heading to court. You getting any idea that maybe the governor's going to back off on this at all? I don't think he's going to back off on this. We're into real primary politics on this. The governor does have uh, at least two announced challengers, maybe three, uh, in his Republican primary. And right now, the sense among Republican primary voters is no masks. Now, you know that there are a lot of parents all over the state in our more than a thousand school districts. Uh, there are a lot of parents who do want to see mask mandates. And it's interesting that it hasn't been the big city mayors or county judges to really uh, defy the governor on some of these orders, as is often the case. Some of the biggest Texas throwdowns start in the ISDs and in the independent school districts because it's your kids and it's your money, things that people are the most passionate about, and people want to keep those kids safe. Um, and I think there may be uh, a chance for some appropriate court action here. Um, the governor has asserted for about a year that uh, he's the only one who has the authority to make any of these decisions, and that's gone largely unchallenged. Um, you may see uh, the Attorney General Ken Paxton uh, suing the Dallas ISD and the Houston ISD looks on track to do the same thing of, of going ahead and mandating masks. And a court challenge may give us more clarity about what the governor's actually allowed to decide in these uh, situations. And there is a court challenge. Uh, a nonprofit group has now sued the governor saying mm -hmm. that that mask mandate or the lack thereof, uh, the governor saying in that executive order, just to clarify here, that schools cannot require, public schools cannot mm -hmm. require masks. That is now being challenged. And for a lot of parents, I'm sure hearing that news, either their kids have just started school or are heading back in a few days, it muddies the waters even further, wondering what could potentially happen with that. Can you give us a realistic scenario now that we have seen a challenge? I think that, and and I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one on your show, Myra, even <laughs> even this evening. But I would say that um, it, it probably to have standing, it needs to be uh, between the state and the school districts uh, as far as the legal challenge is concerned. Um, that's not to say that 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 legal challenge won't go anywhere, but but we'll all you know find out together. Uh, bottom line is that this really needs to be worked out between the different levels of government, uh, local government, state government, and the federal government. Look at the fact also that the Biden administration is suing Governor Abbott and his administration. Over over another one of his executive orders that has to do with um, transportation of migrants, sort of role reversal, right? Usually over the last uh, 10 years or so, it would be Texas suing the feds. 
Now it's the other way around with uh, the Biden administration so in, saying that uh, Governor Abbott's gone too far and trying to create his own immigration policy, having to deal with uh, something that's tangential, which is he uh, Abbott says that um, migrants are bringing COVID-19 into the state. Of course, the facts don't really back that up, at least as far as uh, what we're seeing in the real numbers all across Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Scott Braddock, editor mm -hmm. of the Quorum Report. Thank you so much for your time, Scott, as always, and your insight. Uh, I find it interesting. You think there's going to be a quorum perhaps this week? on the Texas House that some of those lawmakers will come back. So I appreciate that insight. Well, it, it is the quorum report. There so you go. We do, know, we do know a little bit what we're talking about. Yeah, you, you report whether there's a quorum or not. That's right. We have <laughs> the best marketing details. of all right now. Yeah, there you go. A few there other things go. in between. Scott, thanks for your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. So watching a few situations this evening. This is I-10 at Probant. We had that vehicle fire earlier, so you can see still the traffic back up there. This is how that looks on the map. So a lot of red on the map. Also 35 southbound to 90. So a big mess uh, in this area this evening. Also on the north side, have this is starting to clear up. Just a second ago, it was red, but we had a crash earlier at Stone Oak Parkway. Also one at Blanco Road that appears to have been cleared up and look, taking a look at the uh, big map here. Things getting a little bit better, but still some issues here and there. But the big issue right now outside of San Antonio is here in Seguin. I-10 eastbound remains shut down. Traffic down to four miles per hour, some sort of police activity out here. So traffic is being diverted off of I-10. That's also impacting uh, SH-130, the toll road. Why? SH-130 southbound I-10 eastbound is uh, closed right now, so that's definitely impacting things out there. Working to get some more information on exactly the nature of that police activity, but the clear thing is, though, it is definitely impacting traffic here along I-10 in the Seguin area, and of course, we're continuing to get some more information on that, guys. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out, Samuel. We actually have Sky 12 on the way to see whatever is happening along I-10 in Seguin right now and maybe clear up a little bit why there's such a bad traffic back up there. Mm -hmm. We'll follow up, bring you details. Meantime, let's look outside with live cam this evening. Just a few clouds out there, plenty of sunshine. Last few days of summer for some, Adam. Oh, exactly. And right now we're at 93 degrees. Temperatures gradually falling through the 80s. 87 at 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 83 degrees, and midnight still right near 80 degrees. And temperatures really aren't going to get out of control anytime soon. We'll take a look at what we're expecting the rest of the week into the weekend and even first day of school next week for some kids, along with tracking the tropics in just a few minutes. I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of president. Here's the first look at Disney's animatronic version of President Joe Biden. It debuted at the Hall of Presidents attraction in Orlando. For the past few months, creative teams at Disney have been working to add Biden to the stage as the 46th president of the United States. The president himself recorded audio of his presidential oath of office, which is used in the attraction. The Hall of Presidents has been featured at the Magic Kingdom Park since opening day in 1971. The animatronic figure of former President Donald Trump now takes its place on the stage among those who have previously served. All right, outside today, 91 degrees, not all that bad. Kids going back to school, and we still haven't hit 100 degrees. <laughs> Myra's got the, the counter going. She no, does have haven't. the counter. She's paying attention. I know. Yeah. We, no, we have not. And it's In still San Antonio. <laughs> I want to point yeah. that because, you know, Del Rio. Eagle Pass, Tula, yes. Creek Spring. Spring. Yeah, they've Call done ourselves that already. lucky here. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and you know, we, we are past the average date. We're about a month past the average date of when we would typically, you could say, when we would normally hit 100. But there's still about two dozen years of recorded history here that we have not hit 100. So it's always within the realm of possibility. Quiet weather pattern now. Very different from what we had last week. No excessive heat, though, so that means no triple digits in the forecast anytime soon. And there is some tropical activity that we're going to talk about out in the Atlantic, and that could head toward the Gulf of Mexico. Let's get right to our satellite and radar. See just some of those fair weather clouds today. They develop into the afternoon as usual, and now as we get into the evening, they dissipate. But we do have some layering to the clouds. It's kind of nice, some upper-level high clouds um, up above these low-level 
patchy cumulus clouds. What we're looking at here is out in West Texas. Nice to see some shower activity there. It's one part of the state where we are still abnormally dry and even have a little bit of a drought left over, especially down near Big Bend National Park. So south of Alpine, south of Marathon there. And this activity, of course, popping up in the afternoon. Good beneficial maintenance rain for some folks in West Texas. Otherwise it's quiet. Yeah, there's some showers and thunderstorms scattered about the nation, but we don't have any defining feature right now over the lower 48 to really define our weather pattern. No dominant feature. The doors open and we do have this system in the tropics that we're watching and this will likely become our next tropical storm. Right now, max sustained winds at 35 miles per hour. It's moving to the west northwest at 15 miles per hour. Here's the latest forecast from the National Hurricane Center, keeping it a weak system, particularly because of the interaction with land here. Going across the islands, that tends to shred apart those tropical systems a bit. So right now it's looking like a rainy storm, basically a rain rainmaker that's going to be moving westward, but it can make it into the eastern Gulf of Mexico by this weekend. And of course, thereafter, we'll have to see what this is likely to do once it makes it to the Gulf of Mexico. So we'll keep a close eye on it through the week and keep bringing you the updated forecast. Otherwise, our rain chances around here pretty much slim to none. We have this 10% chance in Wednesday through Saturday because of a few coastal showers popping up. So we're talking from Lavaca County to about DeWitt County and closer to the Gulf Coast line, where we'll probably have a few little pop up showers here and there during the days ahead. Sunday and Monday, we could actually have some pop ups a little closer to San Antonio, but nothing like what we had last week in terms of our coverage of rain and of course the more widespread rain. This would be isolated in nature. So generally speaking, quiet and fairly dry. 93 right now, dew point is 72. So it feels like 101. One nice thing is that we actually have a decent breeze. Winds out of the southeast at 25 miles per hour, gusting up to 25 miles per hour. Del Rio gusting up to 32. So it is nice to have that breeze. Del Rio at triple digits. Century mark right at 100. Pleasanton's 94 and Kerrville now at 92. And tomorrow we'll start the day at 77. Make it up to 96 with that nice southeasterly breeze at 10 to 20. So you'll notice that wind again, which is nice. Looking ahead then. The remainder of the week, temperatures don't change a whole lot. We're looking at mid 90s, partly cloudy conditions, and there's that isolated chance of storm Sunday, but Sunday and Monday. All right, thanks, Adam. I want to tell you that we will have an update on the situation in Seguin coming up. We promise you more details about what's happening in the Seguin area. This is I-10 eastbound in Seguin, and we've just learned that it was a deputy involved shooting involving uh, Guadalupe County Sheriff's deputies uh, out there. Uh, one person uh, has been shot, no word on their condition, but it was not the deputy uh, who was hit uh, by that bullet. But what that has been done to traffic is closed uh, some of the eastbound lanes of I-10 and also uh, this is sort of wrapping up in the area around State Highway 130, which is the toll road near Sky 12 right now. As you can see, uh, the situation there that has closed those eastbound lanes in Guadalupe County, guys. Yeah, and what we know, Samuel, is that the person hit was not law enforcement. That the person, we don't know if it was the person involved in the pursuit in one of those vehicles, but it was not law enforcement that was involved, but it was a pursuit that led up. To the shooting and we again don't know what started that pursuit what prompted it why that person uh, was wanted by law enforcement but certainly something that we are continuing to gather some more information on you just saw that shot there from sky 12 a heavy law enforcement presence there and we know what it's doing to traffic at this point but again a deputy involved shooting we know texas rangers now investigating we're going to follow this and get you gather more information as this investigation unfolds Around America today, a record amount of jobs have been added in June. 10.1 million are available. This comes as businesses struggle to hire enough staff to support the reopening of the economy. In a report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, most of the jobs are in professional and business services like hotels and restaurants. We've seen that here in town. Many people looking for jobs are still faced with some challenges such as childcare and concerns about catching the virus at work. 
And the 2021 New Orleans Jazz Fest put on hold due to the pandemic once again. This event, which usually takes place over two weekends in late April, early May, it had been moved to October earlier this year, but officials say the rise in COVID-19 cases in the area forced them to finally cancel the event for this year. The Rolling Stones, Lizzo, Foo Fighters, and Dead & Company were all scheduled to perform. As of right now, Jazz Fest 2022 is scheduled to take place next spring. Taking a look at traffic inside uh, San Antonio, still have uh, this issue, this major backup as a result of that earlier vehicle fire around uh, Pro Band I-10, mm -hmm. I-35, Highway 90. So uh, watch out for that if you are in that area. Of course, we were just mentioning uh, the situation. And again, just a reminder, I-10 eastbound closed down the ramp from State Highway 130 to I-10 East is closed. And this is a look again at that traffic at 90 and 35. Definitely something uh, to keep in mind if you're heading out and about this evening out. Sam, tomorrow we'll start the day in the mid to upper 70s by the afternoon back into the mid 90s. Really right near average for this time of year. The average high is 97. We're thinking about 96 downtown San Antonio, Timberwood Park, Leon Springs, 93, Lavernia and Elmendorf, 96 and a lot of sunshine, but a good breeze. All right, thanks, Adam. We're going to keep following that deputy involved shooting that we've been covering in Seguin. We'll have the latest online and on the night beat as well. We'll see you on the night beat at 10.